have some comments from our panelists. We're going to have a slideshow if we can get the technical difficulties worked out. And then we'll have some time for discussion with you. Um, I'm Ben Carlson. I was uh, reasonably fresh to San Francisco in 1990 and looking for a way to get plugged into the community when I found out about Queer Nation and I was so excited to join up with the group. My role was really kind of behind the scenes um, doing a lot of the organizing and um, you'll see if we get our slideshow going a lot of the actions that we did uh, by which we became known, a lot of the public street activism. So, um, I want to thank the GLBT Historical Society for giving us the museum for the evening. Um, The, the GLBT Historical Society collects and preserves and exhibits and shares with the public and with researchers queer stories, specifically stories of the San Francisco Bay Area LGBT community. And uh, there's a fundraising envelope on your chair. If you feel good about tonight's program and you love the Historical Society like I do, um, we would appreciate an additional donation. I know you all donated five bucks to uh, donated five bucks to get in here tonight. Thank you very much for that. Um, Brian Bringardner, uh, uh, Bringardner, about a month or two ago, contacted us to say, "Hey, it's the 25th anniversary of Coronation San Francisco," and we said, "Huh? Okay, we should do something." And we hustled together and reached out to old. Uh, folks who were still around and available, and I went into the archives, a bunch of us went into the archives, where several members of the community have donated a lot of their materials from Queer Nation. Um, I want to give a particular shout out to Gerard Koskovich, who would be with us, but he's being honored at a milk club dinner across town, so couldn't be here right now. Um, his archive materials were very, very well organized, and really, <laughs> anybody who knows Gerard, will not be surprised to hear that. Um, and they were instrumental in, in putting together tonight's panel. Okay, so, 1990. Um, you'll hear more about uh, what what those days were like. Here comes our fourth panelist, Carl Knapper. Ladies and gentlemen. was a turning point in LGBT activism. Uh, who was here in San Francisco in 1990? All right, fair number of you. Who was in Queer Nation? All right, all right. So um, uh, our first panel is Mark Duran will take us back to those days, but I'm going to start you off with a few quotes from writers and researchers who reflected on those days. Activist scholars Alan Barabay and Jeffrey Escoffier described Queer Nation as the first retro-future postmodern activist group to address LGBT concerns. Susan Stryker wrote, to a significant degree, the relative frequency and acceptability of GLBTQ representation in mass culture in the 1990s and early 21st century can be dated to the emergence of queer nation. Um, Wayland Walker at the University of Georgia said this, in making the theoretical move from object of hatred to subject who resists oppression, Activists in the Queer Nation movement changed American culture and contributed to the social and legal gains made by LGBTQ people over the next two decades. So, Mark Duran co-founded Queer Nation San Francisco with his partner Daniel Pais and the late Steve Mehal. He fell in love with graphic design when he designed the organization's logo and various printed materials. Building on, it, on that experience, he created successful direct mail campaigns for Community United Against Violence, identity programs for HIV Prevention Project and Prevention Point, and advertising for the Coalition on Homelessness. Along the way, Mark's work has won several design and communication awards. He's currently in-house designer for Fenwick and West. Mark Duran. I never do this sort of thing, but I'm going to tell you my story. It's real short, and then we can like hear other stories too. So, um, 1990 started off being a weird year. Uh, a dear friend almost died on the first, and then a couple more deaths on the same day, oddly enough, in May, which was uh, it was kind of a it was very depressing. Um, June rolls around. It's summer. It's you know it's 
was in the summer vacations, all that stuff, my birthday, and then gay day. And so we're right up to gay day. The night before gay day is, is um, the night before gay day then. It wasn't picked Saturday. It was just Saturday before gay day. And so I'm watching TV, and it's the KQED special. It's the uh, town hall meeting between gays and lesbians in New York and San Francisco. So San Francisco's panel was mostly like, um, I would say Harvey Milk Club types, uh, City Hall types. Um, and then New York had act up in this new group called Queer Nation on their panel. And I was like, wow, Queer Nation, what the hell? This is such a cool name. And the people looked cool. And it was uh, Ann Northrup and uh, Ellen Klein. And um, both, I mean, my queer heroes. So, um, anyways, uh, uh, they're yakking and yakking, and, and they start talking about uh, tactics and, and what's appropriate and what's offensive. And of course, you know, ACT UP at this time was like chaining themselves to senators' desks and doors of federal buildings and, you know, photobombing Dan Rather on the 6 o'clock news. And, and um, so they were, you know, there was some heated arguments going on there, and at one point it got really nasty, and people in the audience were yelling, and Ginger Casey just sort of like, she was the host at the fake QED studios, and she said, um, it's time to ramp this down. You gotta like calm down here, kids. And, and Ann Northrup said, this is our town hall meeting, and we don't need moderating from a presumably straight person. <laughs> I fell on the floor. I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> I, I, I fell in love. I fell on the floor, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and the rest of it was just a blur, and I didn't know what to do with myself, so I got on my bike, and, you know, after the show was over, and rode down to the Castro, and I was living in the Mission at the time. Get to Castro in 18th, and ACT UP is blocked off the intersection, and there, I swear it was Peggy Sue, Barbie Jesus, Jason, and the women toilet paper over the Muni wires. <laughs> and I just, I got off my bike and I was like, I'm here, this is it. <laughs> uh, so anyways, gay day happened, blah, blah, blah. That's of course wonderful, but you know, Monday comes around, I'm like, I gotta, gotta move on this, gotta find out where these queer nation people are. So I call a women's building and they're like, yeah, no, there's not a group meeting here. Um, so, uh, but a couple people called, so um, I'll give you their number. And I got um, Steve Mehal's number and uh, Jonathan Katz's number. And so um, I thought, well, um, I'm going to call Alan Klein first and see if it's okay if I, you know, borrow the name. And uh, so I call him up, I get in touch with him, and he's like, oh yeah, start one up, just start one up. And I said, well, okay, we'll call it Queer Nation San Francisco, just to differentiate it, you know, from the real Queer Nation. And, uh, <laughs> As if. Um, so anyway, so I just didn't want to like have any kind of intellectual property problems in the future. So, <laughs> um, so um, uh, I called Steve Meehal, he's in on it, and then I called Jonathan Katz and he was busy. And I find out later why, but um, um, so we meet, he and Daniel and I met at the uh, Cafe Floor and started plotting the revolution. And what do we do? What do we do next? Um, figured out we need more people. <laughs> We're going to need more people. <laughs> and so um, I, I'm not sure how I got in touch with you two, but I got in touch with Jennifer and Carl. I think maybe Steve knew you. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. in touch with us. Yeah. 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 And uh, so we met in our living room. And uh, there was somebody else, too. And I'm not really sure who that was. But anyway, so we do great. But, um, um, uh, so we meet in the living room, we do it a couple of times, I think, and then we divvy up tasks. We run out of room in the women's building. Somebody placed ads in the back of the uh, classified sections of the, uh, I think, the Bay, Bay Area Reporter and maybe the Bay, Bay Times. Times. Bay yeah, Times. it wasn't the Sentinel, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Coming up. Yeah. Was it coming up? Oh, yeah. Same thing. Same yeah. thing? Yeah. yeah. At that time, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and then I worked as a typesetter at the time. I was working at PC World Magazine and Mac World. And we were, you know, they, we, they give us software every now and then and, and hardware. And, 
and one of the editors brought, walked over a box of like Avery um, stickers that you could like run through a laser print. This is like new technology. <laughs> <laughs> Very modern. Yeah. And like, well, we could use these as advertising somehow. So I, I started typesetting up a bunch of stickers and I whipped up this thing in about two minutes, this, this logo, and, and uh, just, you know, Queer Rights Direct Action underneath with like the women's building, 730s Wednesday night. And uh, so anyway, so we were like going, we were like real polite, we stick her around. Uh, <laughs> no, we were at the beginning, it was Steve and me, we weren't sure, we didn't want to stick around people's posters on telephone poles, that was an issue, because we didn't want to cover up their band information. So, <laughs> Corners at the at, at, uh, intersections, like 16th and in Market and stuff, and we're like, oh, maybe we'll get some people to show up. Maybe some will show up. And so, uh, women's building happens. It's like that night. I guess it's the 18th of July, and uh, we're there. We're kind of nervous, and we have prepared statements written, and we pull out about 20 chairs and set off in a semicircle, like we're going to have an AA meeting or something. <laughs> and. Um, and uh, uh, people started coming in, and then more people came in, and then more people came in, and more people came in, and it was angry, and there were people yelling, and and we're like, okay, let's start the meeting. We like unpacked all the chairs, and there's still people coming in, and um, so we started reading. I think Steve started reading this statement, and didn't get halfway through before Jean Harris, remember her? Yeah. <laughs> She jumps up and starts berating us about how using the word queer is going to set us back 50 years and blah, 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 blah and storms out with all our sycophants in, 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 in her way. And, uh, and she's just, uh, she was a mess, but whatever. And, um, oh, so, um, but it still got crazier and crazier and, and this couple in the front row, it was like this cute guy and this cute girl, and they would, they just come up to us and were like, hey, you know, we just had some facilitation training at the Harvey Milk Institute. And we're like, wow, cool. And they said, well, can we help? And I'm like, I don't go for it. So they took over. It was Jonathan Katz, and I don't remember the person's name, but she was this nice bi woman from Santa Cruz. I do remember all that, because she made me make all the bi stickers. And <laughs> um, Susan? Yeah, I'm getting old socks. But um, yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, so they facilitate. And it's still angry. And people are going off. And, and um, But anyways, 9 o'clock rolls around, and we still haven't resolved anything <laughs> other than to meet again. So yeah. we all head out, and we just start marching down the street. And we did it up in the Castro and took over the street again. And that was our first night. The end. <laughs> Folks in the back, can you hear okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Rachel Pepper has written four books, including co-authoring The Transgender Child and editing the Ippy Award-winning Transitions of the Heart, Stories of Love, Struggle, and Acceptance by Mothers of Transgender and Gender Variant Children from Clea's Press. Rachel is also a licensed therapist specializing in the mental health needs of foster youth and of trans-identified youth and adults in the Bay Area. She and her family live in Oakland. Rachel Pepper. and I was 25 years old. I was a recent arrival to San Francisco, having chased my queer utopian dreams clear across the country. Landing into a plum job as sidelines buyer at a different light on Castro Street, I was immediately immersed smack dab into the middle of the supercharged, extra fabulous, pre-internet vortex of the LGBT information superhighway. <laughs> My hunger for belonging, my quest for a community of like-minded queers, my sense of political outrage, and my boundless energy all converged that fateful day I saw the poster announcing the first Queer Nation meeting. Fed up with government complacency and the conservative political gloom of the late 1980s, budding activists were especially on edge from a string of recent gay bashings happening around San Francisco that spring. 
Many of us were already members of ACT UP and keenly aware of a new type of queer activism percolating in other cities, including the recent distribution of the riveting manifesto, Queers Read This and I Hate Straights, <laughs> New York City Pride. <laughs> Something had to give. And then that first meeting on July 18, 1990, how to describe the electric energy and fragrant sense of hope charging the air the night Queer Nation was born. Hundreds of us stuffed into a meeting room at the women's building, cruising, chatting, and getting organized. I will never forget it, because the next six months were probably the most thrilling time of my life. That night, I finally found the community I set out cross-country to find, an eclectic, diverse group of mostly 20-something young queers on the verge of changing the community from the inside out forever. We were angry, loving, sexy, stylish, smart, funny, and hopeful. Our community had been suppressed and attacked, ignored and left to die. But we hadn't given up. We were banding together, empowering ourselves, emerging stronger and smarter, and more determined than ever to bring about change. We were queer comrades in a fight for our lives. We had passion, conviction, and a self-contained, near-ideal dating pool. <laughs> for, a glittering, for a glittering, glorious moment, the city was ours. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> that very first night, I met people who are still my friends today. People who went on to become leaders in their fields as journalists, novelists, <coughs> artists, and filmmakers, as tech innovators, academics, midwives, entrepreneurs, educators, politicos, therapists, and community organizers. In other words, we still run this town. <laughs> that night, I looked around and saw myself reflected back 250 times. That night, I put out a call to start a women's caucus, and Labia, Lesbians and Bi Women in Action, was founded then and there, becoming one of Queer Nation's most vibrant and active focus groups, leading events such as Girls' Night Out on September 21st, 1990, at Baja Cantina, mm -hmm. <laughs> and its follow-up on November 9th in North Beach. How empowering it was to take over a straight establishment and make it our own, if only for one night. We remember it was not so easy to be not so safe to be visibly out in San Francisco in those days. And at several events, Labia and other focus groups sponsored, participants were harassed, bashed, and were arrested. Looking at the chronology of Queer Nation actions from 1990, I love this document. Did you do this? No. Oh. <laughs> from 1990, it's incredible to think that between the founding of Queer Nation in July and the end of that same calendar year, there were almost 40 actions, including visibility kiss-ins, a mall cruise-in, a bee-in at Aquatic Park, and a Lavender Santa event at Union Square, which alone raised $2,000 for charity. <laughs> there were protests at the Russian consulate, at police station, civic center, and in Sacramento. Queer Week emerged, and a collection of coming out stories was published. We declared it Year of the Queer, and screened Madonna's Vogue video before its public release. Re that was so awesome. <laughs> Reveling in its super sexy queerness, yet outraged that MTV considered it too risque to air. A fact more shocking than any queer content it may have had. And I'm still in awe of the amazing forum on racism that the United Colors of Queer Nation put on just two months after the founding of Queer Nation. A riveting experience for all present. Hundreds of people would attend some of these meetings and actions. And this was before the networking power of the internet. Something my teenager can't even understand. <laughs> One of Queer Nation's most amazing legacies was its visual impact, including the array of fluorescent stickers we dreamt of, <laughs> photocopied, cut up by hand, and distributed at meetings, which would then be attached to every surface in town. <laughs> Queer smash back! A dyke was here. Bag power! Promote homosexuality. And my favorite, Dykes take over the world. <laughs> you used to see these everywhere in 1990, including on buildings, street posts, and on the backs of our requisite black leather jackets. <laughs> What's ironic to think about tonight is how radical and fringe we were considered by the so-called gay establishment at the time. They scorned our actions, criticized us in the press, and cringed at our demands. My columns about Queer Nation in the Bay Area Reporter would incite a string of outraged letters about how we youngsters were ruining San Francisco and bringing shame upon the respectable gay residents of the city. 
And yet, when I look back at our demands and consider the lasting ramifications of our actions, I'm amazed not only at the awareness we brought to a wide range of LGBT concerns, but how quickly our mission went mainstream. Just one generation later, visibility for LGBT folks is at an all-time high. Gay marriage is now legal. Gay flags fly freely, and City Hall glows with not only the rainbow, but transgender pride colors. Archives like the ones belonging to this museum preserve memories of that special time. And major universities such as Yale house collections of memorabilia and zines donated by people like all of you and myself to enable new generations of queer scholars and community members to review and research our actions. Students are writing their research papers and dissertations on queer nation, and here we sit, in history. Although many of us have chosen since to move to the sunnier side of the bay, and many others <laughs> and many others have unfortunately been forced out of the Bay Area altogether due to raising rents. Queer people still lead most of the socially progressive causes in San Francisco, including the current fight for tenants' rights. It's ironic how mainstream we've become when many of us used to revel in our outsider status, even while fighting so hard for equal rights. I wonder how many of us kind of miss those days. I know I sometimes do. Despite my earnest involvement during Queer Nation's first year, I became dis disenchanted quickly and left when a soul-sucking, for me, combination of several factors killed my fun. Emerging leaders were vilified by other members. Racism and sexism reared their ugly heads. Political correctness muddied our message and consensus stalled us out. Heartbroken by this turn of events, Many of us turned to other pursuits, and not too long afterwards, Queer Nation San Francisco imploded. I credit Queer Nation for solidifying for me what has become my lifelong commitment to a full spectrum of LGBT causes, including authoring four books, fulfilling my own dream of becoming a parent. My daughter, Frances, who is here tonight, is about to finish high school. <laughs> <laughs> I dragged her along. <laughs> Becoming a licensed therapist to address the mental health needs of underserved LGBT people in foster youth, and recently launching the Unicorn Project, an art and activities group for transgender children ages 4 to 10, with my partner Kellen, also here tonight. I could never have envisioned any of these things back in 1990 when I was a single, childless, duck on bike, spending most nights out at clubs with names like Faster Pussycat, Uranus, and Club Q. <laughs> I also learned from Queer Nation that group process isn't for me. <laughs> and that I'm happiest and more productive in solo pursuits. That insight gave me the courage to launch my own business, become a single parent by choice, and eventually go back to school. I'm proud of the time I spent in Queer Nation, and proud of where my life has taken me since as a parent, a partner, and a healer. Over the past 25 years, I've tried to live each day with the kind of passion, energy, optimism, and empowerment we felt together back in 1990. May we always remember how fortunate we are to have had that experience, and that we are around to reminisce, continue our good work, and still be able to chant we're here, we're, we're queer, get used to it. Thank you. So, um, luckily, we've just worked out some technical difficulties, and I'm going to show you some slides as an interlude between our first two panelists and our second two panelists. Um, there's a lot of slides to go through, so I'm going to go kind of fast. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll start. Uh, I'll start tapping buttons here. Um, I, and some of the, some of this is kind of chronological. So this I hate. St oh, and I, I apologize for the graphics that are superimposed up there in the corner. We don't know how to get rid of them. Um, so this is this is a one page of this uh, notorious document that circulated in New York City. Uh, that uh, marked the beginning of Queer Nation in New York. Uh, here we are looking at a July 4th issue of Out Week uh, about the New York action. Here's Don Baird and Steve Mehal on the right there, uh, co-founder. Um, this is photographed by Danny Nicoletta at Club Uranus. 
uh, October 31st, 1990. Um, and here are some ideas. Some nice note person, a note taker, uh, jotted down ideas from the first creation San Francisco meeting. So we quickly got organized. Uh, you know, we've got a statement of purpose. We've got flyers. Mark's performing his graphics magic. Uh, the flyers proliferate. Um, and there is a black slide. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, no. 